um, I suppose you, you you see my screen? We do. Yes. Okay. So we're going to be speaking about uh, dreams. Um, first of all, a few words about sleep. Apparently sleep is important um, as evidenced by the fact that in a lifetime of about 80 years, we spend uh, uh, almost 25 years sleeping. Although medicine, science, neuroscience has absolutely no idea about why exactly we sleep. Out of the, the, that period of sleep, which is uh, uh, about over 20 years of sleeping, uh, about a quarter of it is spent dreaming. And I think today we can easily say that even medicine knows even less about dreams or why we dream. And it's probably one of the most fascinating aspects of the function of the mind. So a quick view of what today we know about sleep, and this has been uh, obviously analyzed with all the variety of technologies that we have developed, uh, electroencephalogram, cardiogram, and uh, the, all of these information and uh, are um, sort of picked up and registered by big computers and analyzed in terms of the mental functions. So the uh, sleep uh, stages are today classified in three different stages. Previously, it was four. Now they have broken it down to three. So basically, N1, N2, and N3. Most important phase of sleep is the stage N3, which actually is a very uh, slow wave activity of the brain. And um, the uh, brain activity basically is dominated by delta waves. These are very slow waves. I've given you here the, the frequency, which is half to four hertz maximum. And this stage of sleep is very important, especially uh, for the rest of the body. This, this, this is the time where the body is recuperating. And uh, the, the entry stage is defined by the, the percentage of delta waves that we present during that time. And sleep efficacy is based on how, what percentage of delta waves a person has during the night. And then there is this strange uh, sort of fourth stage, which is called paradoxical sleep. This is also called REM which is rapid eye movement, uh, where uh, during which the person is dreaming. And the, the dreaming brain actually is a very active brain, uh, paradox, um, as, as, a, as opposed and compared to the other stages of sleep. And um, during this time, the brain is active, but the body is in total at atonia. That means there is absolutely no movement normally. Of course, in pathological situations, there might be. Let's have a look and see what happens during the dreaming phase. Now, the new technologies have shown that during the dreaming phase, most of the cortex, brain cortex, is inactive, except for the occipital cortex, which actually corresponds to the vision area and there is a lot of activity in the limbic area and also in the lower brain which sometimes is referred to as the reptilian brain so in other words during dreams the brain is actually seeing visions this is our inner um, sort of cinema the brain is actually feeling emotions and reacting to them because the cerebellum is basically in charge of heartbeat and blood pressure and all the basic instincts. So the brain actually is responding to the images that are projected in this area and we are witnessing. So it, it can be said that during the dreaming phase, the brain is actually 
uh, the, um, is not distinguishing reality from uh, uh, fiction. That means that we are actually fully experiencing the, the dream that we are seeing in our minds. Now, uh, once again, as I mentioned before, we still don't know why we dream. Now, what is, of course, um, interesting is that uh, sleep is necessary for health. This was uh, evidenced by um, in, in, on voluntary persons who were underwent uh, um, sort of tests of not sleeping for a certain time. And uh, it showed that they actually had no physical or physiological um, damage, except that the mind started playing tricks and they started having um, visions or uh, illusions and having sort of the uh, psychotic episodes. So the sleep is necessary for the uh, optimum function of the mind. But also in the sleep process, two phases are pr uh, uh, primary, uh, have a primary importance. One is the, uh, the entry stage, which is the deep sleep. And the second one is this paradoxical sleep, which is the dreaming phase. Now, after a period of sleep deprivation, be it um, voluntary or for whatever reason, uh, maybe you have to stay up because your child is sick, so you don't sleep a few nights. There is going to be a recuperation in the uh, uh, sleeping process. You will not be sleeping more hours, but you will be spending more time in entry and especially more time in paradoxical sleep. So there's a compensation that the brain does to recover and recuperate the most important phases of sleep. So dreaming is one of them. Now, dreaming has been established to actually be present uh, not only in humans, but also in many animals. Many animals actually sleep. It has been demonstrated even fish or reptiles, they sleep. Um, and this is absolutely necessary for the recuperation of their mental, central nervous system. And uh, actually dreaming has been established that even a uh, fetus is dreaming. So we have uh, actually many theories today, scientists are proposing theories of the importance of dreaming uh, and what it does exactly in the system. So what we can say in, uh, with certitude is that people who don't sleep there is an accumulation of certain neurotransmitters which um, are not reabsorbed or reactivated, which means that the brain is probably stimulated excessively if people do not have their proper amount of sleep. And what is recently discovered, there's an accumulation of beta amyloid, which is also present in the Alzheimer's disease. So obviously, as I said, we are still at the very beginning of unraveling the sleeping process, especially the dreaming process. Now, what is important in our discussion today is that the psychological and the physiological impact of sleep, especially of dreams, is exactly the same as if you are experiencing, we were experiencing reality in that time. So this is the point where we have to keep in mind. Now, uh, another point is that sleep cycles, there are in the night, the night is broken down to what is known as ultradian cycles. These are cycles within the sleep period. Are, these cycles are usually lasting anything, anything between 60 and 90 minutes where actually the brain goes through all the different phases that we saw before. And every time the cycle ends with a period of REM, that means dreaming phase sleep. And REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, is uh, occupying the last part of each cycle. And this uh, uh, duration of REM sleep increases throughout the night 
and usually it can be anything between 15 and 20 minutes, but it can even reach 40 minutes at the end of the night. And when we wake up from, from a dream, at the best, we remember the last few minutes of the dream. You can imagine that you've been dreaming a whole, you've been watching a movie for 40 minutes, but you can recall only the last part. Many people cannot even recall that. Uh, we have many patients that have told us, I don't dream, which is impossible. The, when we have analyzed those patients in sleep laboratories, it has demonstrated that they are dreaming almost as much as any other person, except they don't recall their dreams. And that's why they uh, believe they don't dream. Now, what again, as I mentioned previously, about 20 to 25% of our sleep time is occupied by dreaming. And this, if you bring it to an overall average of a lifetime, we are talking about we are spending six years dreaming, which means I, I call it our uh, internal Hollywood. This amount is even higher in small babies. It, it says up to 50% of the sleep time is occupied by dreams. Now, I would like to spend some time on uh, the modern dream theories, uh, which are, if you go on the internet, you probably will find something like uh, between 15 and 20 different theories about dreams. And what is interesting is that when we will dis uh, start the discussion on dreams in Chinese medicine, we'll see that a lot of these modern theories have been included in the ancient concepts that Chinese had about dreams. Obviously, the, probably the most prominent um, dream theories are involving the psychoanalytic schools, starting with Freud and especially Jung. Now, um, Freudian analysis, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, um, but I have read texts and most of the Freudian analysis concerns basically sexual repression and dreams for Freud had a lot of them had some sexual connotations aspects. Uh, with Jung, it's um, basically the idea that the subconscious is actually um, manifesting during the dreams. For both Freud and Jung, it's uh, obvious that it's the subconscious of the person who is speaking through imagery during the dreams. Then other dream theories, which are concerned that during the dreaming phase, actually even in, in utero, the small child, uh, the, the embryo, or the fetus, sorry, not the embryo, the fetus is dreaming. And during these dreams, they are actually um, sort of preparing the brain for future functions, and especially uh, the connections inside the brain, which are developing. Now, the more interesting part for us is obviously interacting dreams, which are dreams that uh, uh, sort of the topic is uh, what is happening around us in the world. And uh, obviously, some people consider dreams to be random and uh, random manifestations, which uh, uh, for some dreams it is true, but I don't agree with this. Uh, because uh, we will be de um, developing this point further. Um, some other people consider dreams to be a way to release um, either unnecessary memories or negative memories or impact of ne negative uh, um, incidents in our life. But also dreams are uh, have this pos uh, possibility to be uh, to have a healing quality. And this I have had op um, ample opportunity to verify in patients where they have dreamt and visualized themselves actually healing and improving certain performances, which uh, then uh, actually manifests itself in their waking life. 
So mood regulating dreams, and this probably will tie in very well with uh, uh, the concepts that we are going to discuss about uh, uh, sort of how we see dreams as being ways of regulating emotions and clearing out emotions. So this mood regulating aspect and uh, memory and learning. That's another very interesting topic where people through uh, dreams can consolidate certain aspects of memory, especially long term memory. This has actually been utilized by some people uh, who have been uh, uh, de developing a sort of subliminal learning during sleep, uh, where people are listening uh, during their night, uh, usually to things that they have to learn and prefer preferably their own voice, which is easier for them to integrate. Um, I know people who have learned languages, foreign languages very easily by uh, using this method. But then we have another category or other categories of dreams. First of all, premonitory dreams, which is probably the most strange and fascinating aspect that has fascinated humanity from the beginning of time. I mean, we have it in all the ancient texts, even in the Bible, mentions of premonitory dreams. Somebody dreams of something and this thing happens. And um, processing dreams in which we are dealing with issues in our life or in our psycho-emotional life in the dream and we are resolving problems like that or issues and especially the most amazing aspect is lucid dreaming in which the person is aware that they are actually dreaming and lucid dreaming has again been a fascination for a lot of um, sort of the Taoist or Buddhist practitioners or monks who have sought to actually achieve this lucid dreaming and through practice and etc. We'll have a, a quick look at and see um, how we can develop this. Now, concerning premonitory dreams, there is, a, I forget his name, a Russian there was a Russian um, neurologist who registered uh, thousands of patient dreams. And he discovered that many patients dreamt uh, years before a certain pathology that, was going, that they were going to develop. And for him, it was an obvious statement that the premonitory dreams, at least concerning disease, is actually uh, manifesting itself before the physical manifestation in the body. We are not surprised because we know in Chinese medicine that any physical disease ha has taken several years of energetic disbalance before it actually manifests. So that is not a surprise for us. But again, we are going to go back and see, uh, have a look at that later. Now, what is it in Chinese medicine? How do Chinese uh, consider um, dreams? First of all, the, in Chinese medicine, dreaming is the domain of Hun, the etheric soul. And for them, the Hun is residing in the liver. Now, this is very interesting. The connection the Chinese have made between dreaming and the liver. Um, as a, a quick reminder, what occurs during the REM sleep, rapid eye movement, is first of all, the eyes are moving as though you were watching an inner movie. Other things also take place, which is uh, quite interesting. The body is in total um, atony, that means there's absolutely no muscular reactions. But then there is a convergence, a concentration of blood to the outer genitalia, which manifests itself in men as a, a partial erection. When in sleep laboratories, one of the um, things that are measured, obviously, besides the brain function and the heart, blood pressure, the breathing, they put electrodes near the nose and the throat to see if people have sleep apnea, if they have disturbances in breathing. 
They also, in men, sometimes we use what is known as a penile ring to measure the uh, blood flow to the outer genitalia, uh, which uh, is used mainly for diagnosis of primary or secondary impotence. Of course, it does not have a um, bearing on the topic of today, but what is interesting, we know that in Chinese medicine, the law of the liver channel goes to the outer genitalia, and it's basically, its function is, uh, has a, a lot of um, local uh, action. So in a way, the Chinese had noticed that besides the visual aspect of dreams, there is also a physiological aspect, which is defined by the law of the liver channel. And so again, Western medicine has absolutely no explanation to give why there is a blood flow to the external genitalia. And this is independent of, of the topic of the dream. You don't have to have an erotic dream in order to have a blood flow to that part of the body. It's just physiological, even if you're dreaming of landscape or whatever, this uh, takes place, it occurs. Now, what is interesting, which is specifically Chinese, is that the liver is considered the record keeper. And it helps to bring events from the subconscious into the conscious mind. This is very important because we know that the liver as an emissary is situated, the wood L movement is between the water and fire. And we say that the liver is responsible to bring things out from the deeper aspect, the subconscious, to the conscious mind, which is fire, the shen. So from the zhi to the shen, and it's the hun is responsible. But this is not all. What uh, a lot of the information that um, I'm going to share with you comes from this uh, 16th century text, uh, which is the analysis and conclusion of dreams by Chen Chi Yuan. And in this text, he says this, he states this strange sentence, Hun knows the future, Po conceals the past. In other words, Hun has the capacity to travel in the past and in the future. Now, obviously this sounds a little bit uh, like science fiction, but if we understand exactly uh, what Hun represents, Hun has this capacity to wonder. That's the, the sort of nature of Hun, to wonder. And they say that during the night, Hun uh, detaches itself from the physical body and has the capacity to wonder. Where does it wander? It can wander in time or in space. It can visit other places. And therefore, we can bring information which we normally we don't have access to, and we can bring it into the conscious mind. Uh, you, if you are familiar with Feng Shui, Chinese Feng Shui, one of the things they actually, they advise us not to have any mirrors around the bed. The reason being that then the Hun, when it wanders at night, it might see itself in the mirror and be scared and you will have bad dreams. So this is a, a feng shui explanation not to have mirrors around the bed. Now, the job of uh, liver, is, the liver is known as the, the general of the army and its function basically is to protect. And therefore it is intimately connected with our external, with our um, Wei Qi defensive energy. And therefore, uh, one of the things that the Hun, uh, the, sorry, the liver has to do is to protect on the surface. But when the pathogen has penetrated, the, uh, also the liver has the job and uh, the function of releasing the pathogenic factors from inside. Now, the liver is very important during sleep because we will see that the Wei Qi, um, at night penetrates inside and will circulate within the tongue food, especially the tongue organs. 
And the tongue organs, the ear organs are known to store and they store besides emotions, they store pathogenic factors and the liver has to release them. And when it releases these, these are actually uh, released in forms, visual forms. And this is how we then 